Hello everyone, my name is Catalyst, welcome back to the channel, I hope you all are doing well. Today's video presentation is going to be in a little bit of a different style than normal. Normally I have clips in the background while I talk, but today's video is going to be more of a slow burn as we are going to have a heavy dose of these map cinematics. Today we are going to be talking about the maps of Battlefield 2042. One of the most common complaints you might hear when it comes to Battlefield 2042 is that the maps are really bad. But why are they so bad? You'll often hear phrases such as, there is no cover, or the map is too big. And while those are not incorrect statements, they are very vague. I won't insult your intelligence by thinking that you cannot tell what makes a map good or bad, but what I do want to do is dive a little deeper and get into the meat and bones as to why Battlefield 2042's maps are some of the worst in the franchise's 20 year history. In order to do that today, I have enlisted a little bit of help. In order to make the best video on this topic that I could, I needed to talk to a maps expert, somebody who could give some greater insight as well as offer a comparing perspective to mine as to what makes a map good or bad. Because like many things, this topic does have a level of subjectivity to it. There are no facts, just opinions. So I decided to reach out to Gravity, who is a friend of the channel, and someone that I hold in high regard in terms of his Battlefield knowledge. He is someone that has been playing Battlefield since Battlefield 1942, and he has a great series on his own YouTube channel that highlights some of the best and worst maps in Battlefield history. I highly recommend you go and watch those videos, especially if you have been playing this franchise for a long time. The link to his channel will be in the description below, and while he is not making an appearance in today's video, he helped me quite a lot in the information and formation of this script, and I'll be referencing his thoughts and opinions as the video goes on. This video will have chapters in the description below, and you can scrub through the video and skip to parts that you are interested in, but I would hope and suggest that you sit through the entire thing. So, go get a stack. With that being said, I think we've introed quite enough, let's talk about why the maps in Battlefield 2042 are so bad. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. You underestimate my power. Don't try it. Even if you are not as big of a Star Wars nerd as I am, surely you have either seen or know of the scene from Revenge of the Sith where Obi-Wan leaps off the lava river and taunts Anakin with the ever so famous phrase, It's over Anakin, I have the high ground. If by chance you have not watched that scene, I'm sure in some way you learned that high ground is incredibly important in any battle. It puts you at a distinct advantage for whatever situation gets thrown at you, and when it comes to map design, areas of the map that offer that vertical advantage are extremely important. This isn't something that you have to worry about too much in games like Call of Duty, Rainbow Six, and Halo, apart from some rare cases, but in Battlefield it's something that you have to worry about constantly because of the scale of the game. Battlefield maps over the years have become more and more synonymous with the scale in which they are framed in. More recently, a typical framework for your standard Battlefield map is one that revolves around some gigantic object or structure within the map's design. Maps such as Giant Shadow, Hainan Resort, Twisted Steel, Zavid 311, and in Battlefield 2042, discarded. Now, the reasoning itself for including these gigantic focal points on the map is something that makes perfect sense to me and should make sense to you as well. As a developer, you would want something on the map that A makes players want to play around said structure and B makes players invested in the overall theming of the map. Now the maps I just named may not be your favorite maps of all time, they might not even be maps that you like, but the execution of their vertical structures and the design of the areas around them vary from good to poor, and while in other Battlefield titles, verticality is quite varied between gradual and abrupt verticality, in Battlefield 2042, the majority of instances in which there is verticality on a map, it comes in the form of being extremely abrupt and very oppressive. I'm not talking about your standard two or three story buildings, those have been in Battlefield games longer than I've been playing them. No, I'm talking about the monstrous structures that are so large they offer unprecedented amounts of map control and alter the standard gameplay loop far too much. 
As Gravity was quick to point out to me, we learned in Battlefield 4 with maps like Dawnbreaker and Siege of Shanghai that skyscraper gameplay, and massive structures in general for that matter, had the tendency to ruin the player experience far more often than it improved it because of how it affected map flow. In nearly every single Battlefield 2042 map, there is at least one of these structures that either play a pivotal role in how the map plays or becomes a focal point purely because of its size. Renewal wall, data center, and power station, kaleidoscopes, skyscrapers, and offices, hourglasses, stadium, and skyscrapers, manifest crane network, discarded ships and scrap piles, breakaways, oil rigs, and cliff face, exposures, well, the entire map, <laughs> and orbitals launch sites. Some of these locations do become less relevant depending on the player count and game mode that you're playing, but for the most part, they remain included in most map and game mode combinations. These structures almost always contain capturable objectives, so you will have players running to and from these flag locations quite frequently. And that's just a roundabout way of saying that what lies around these structures is just as important as the structures themselves. Having the structures themselves is not the problem, it's how DICE creates player movement in and around the map that matters. This is where Battlefield 2042 falters heavily. Discarded is map that I mentioned earlier because I think that this map in particular is the biggest offender, but quite frankly, any map that has a structure like this suffers from some of the same problems that are only amplified in Battlefield 2042. The problem stems from 2042's extensive use of the cluster system. Continuing with Discarded as our example map, the main focus of the map is centered around the beach cargo ship that contains at least two objectives, sometimes three, depending on whether or not you're playing 128 players. The goal of the design is to keep the battle engaging by keeping players in the same area by fighting over flags that are very close together, as opposed to a more traditional system in which there are single flags that are spread out in interesting locations across the map. Multiple flags in and around a large vertical structure become a focal point for players, as they know that this is where most of the action will be taking place. Therefore, there is no incentive to leave these places. This is problematic for a couple of reasons. Having a huge cluster of flags in this location means that assaulting that sector of flags, no matter what direction you're coming from, is a Herculean task because the terrain surrounding the ship is flat and open, with the only cover being offered are structures that they themselves offer height advantage for campy players if they wanted to be there. For the few players or vehicles that actually manage to survive the height advantage and open terrain to get on the flag, only find out that they are horribly outnumbered because once again, since the main cluster of flags is there, the defenders have no reason to leave, and that is compounded into a much more volatile piece of the puzzle, and that is the spawn system. In order to keep things from becoming a total clusterfuck inside the point, a lot of the random spawn points for these flags are placed outside the point. like way outside the point to where you're being spawned out in the middle of nowhere and have to run back to the gigantic structure where players are waiting on top looking to shoot down at you. This is exactly the problem with older maps in the franchise that we mentioned earlier, maps like Hainan Resort in which all the spawn points outside the main hotel objective spawn players at the bottom of the hill and they have to run up towards the hotel with minimal cover while defenders shoot down on them. Any map which has a large vertical structure providing high ground advantage should never, and I mean never, have spawn locations set on the low ground around it without also giving significant cover. This happens, unfortunately, all the time in Battlefield 2042 and is why the game constantly feels like you are fighting an uphill battle. And that issue is compounded by the fact that taking random spawns on flags have never been so dangerous because you will be spawned in the middle of nowhere beneath the towering structure and that impedes both defenders spawning on the flag and attackers pushing towards the flag. One of the reasons tall buildings and structures worked okay in past games compared to 2042 is because other flags were not a mile away from the major structure. In those games, there was an incentive to leave the rooftops and push other flags. In Discarded, Breakaway, Manifest, and Hourglass, the flag distances are just so damn far that it is of a higher value to stay in the best cluster, which in 2042 
often happens to be the super vertical flag clusters. And the kicker is that it's not just the central flags on these maps that are designed this way. Oftentimes, even bordering flags are designed with similar philosophies, making traveling to outlier flags even less desirable. And that's the difference between a map like Discarded and a similar map in design like Twisted Steel. Although the two bridge objectives on Twisted Steel are important and offer height advantage and map control to the team that owns them, attackers can still get to those objectives due to the terrain around it and the verticality is not too oppressive to where you'd rather quit the lobby than run back and try to retake it. But you don't have to do that as there are other flags on the map that are easier to get to and that is really saying something because Twisted Steel had a really really bad reputation of being a map that had poor map flow due to players only fighting over the middle objectives while the outlier flag saw no action but even then it still doesn't hold a candle to the desolate wasteland that exists around battlefield 2042's massive structures This is the point that most of you were expecting when clicking on this video. The one thing that you can always come back to as the root reason as to why Battlefield 2042 maps suffer in their design. For me personally, I think that the smaller the map is, generally speaking, the better it is overall. The smallest you can make the playable zone while also making it cater to all three phases of core Battlefield gameplay without compromising its scale, that is where the sweet spot in design is. That is something that some of you might immediately disagree with. Regardless of my personal preference, I would imagine that the popular opinion is that, as it pertains to Battlefield 2042, the maps are way too big. When pre-planning for this video, I had the crazy idea to calculate the average time it took to get between flags in the past three Battlefield titles, for my own curiosity and for comparison's sake. This would mean that for every vanilla map since Battlefield 1, I would need to time myself running from each flag to every other flag in the game, and while my heart was in it, my brain sat me down and said, listen, you're gonna need to think about your life choices and time management. So instead, I started with some baby steps. I decided to time myself running from deployment to deployment in every vanilla map from the past three titles, trying to take the most optimal route possible. So here's how that went. I started walking, uh, tax printing, and running, and more running, and more running. Hey, someone left their lights on. Stop. Reinstall Battlefield 5 because we didn't have it installed for this video. Resume running, and more running. More running, bathroom break, resume running, running, more running, you guys won't believe this, but uh, more running, and last but not least, running. And after all that running, here's what I found. On average, it takes about 2 minutes and 40 seconds to get from deployment to deployment on Battlefield 2042's maps. In total, it took me almost 19 minutes to do the test, excluding loading times and other testing ideas. The largest time that we entered was Breakaway, at 3 minutes, 43 seconds, and 67 milliseconds, which checks out seeing as the map was supposed to be, what, 3 times bigger than Hamada? <laughs> That's not so bad. But unfortunately, before I went on to test the other games, I found that this test was a little bit flawed. By looking at the data, I'm sure there is one number from 2042 that is sticking out for you, and that is Discarded's time, sitting at 1 minute and 45 seconds, and I'm sure you're thinking, why is that so short? That map is gigantic, because the playable zone area looks like this. And yeah, that doesn't exactly do the map layout justice now, does it? So. All the time I had spent running across these wastelands was unfortunately wasted because my evidence didn't really do the maps justice. Or disservice, I suppose. So, I realized that in order to really be satisfied with my results, I would have to go back to my original plan. So, I loaded up Battlefield 2042, fully prepared to run from every flag to every other flag to collect data, and the first map I loaded up was Hourglass. And about halfway through, I realized how much do I need to put myself through just to prove how unnecessarily large these maps are. So I decided that instead of collecting data from every single point you can go to in the game, I would simplify it to how long it takes to get from cluster to cluster and figure that's good enough to prove my point. 
I did try to enlist some help from my pal Jordy to make things easier because, you know, two jaded Battlefield players are better than one, but unfortunately... Hello? <laughs> you, you already... <laughs> You already gave a deep sigh as to what we're testing. What do you want? Um, I am testing how long it takes to run between every single flag on every single map in the game. What? Now, of course, with all of this, there are some dependent variables that may change the outcome. Things like spawn locations, the terrain, player pathing, player decision making, things like taking the elevator up to the top of B1 on orbital instead of taking a zip line, parachute speed, whether you jump off the building at all, and of course what specialist you're using does come into play as well. I did these tests on the 128 player versions of these maps because that is what they're designed for at the end of the day. I didn't use any specialist abilities and I tax printed the entire way. On that same note, also consider that the movement speed is likely not the same between games, although Battlefield 2042 doesn't really get much of a pass here considering that it's probably the fastest. The only true inconsistency is that I was unfortunately unable to test the new 128 player version of Renewal because DICE in their infinite wisdom have the old version in their hostable portal server playlist. Regardless, here is what the data said. In Battlefield 2042, it takes a player on average around 1 minute and 28 seconds to rotate between flags in the game. The average time per map is as follows. Hourglass takes 1 minute 38 seconds, Old Renewal takes 1 minute 40 seconds, Orbital takes 1 minute 21 seconds, Discarded takes 1 minute 19 seconds, Breakaway takes nearly 2 minutes at 1 minute and 58 seconds, Manifest is the smallest amount of time with 1 minute and 6 seconds, and Kaleidoscope takes around 1 minute and 13 seconds. With that data collected, I went and did the same test with the vanilla maps of Battlefield 5, and this is where things get interesting. In comparison to the monstrous near minute and a half time of Battlefield 2042, it takes you on average 42.5 seconds to rotate between flags in the launch maps of Battlefield 5. Aerodrome takes 41.5 seconds, Aras takes 49.4, Rotterdam takes 33.6, Devastation takes 31.8, Fiel takes 36.1, Narvik takes 35.5, and Twisted Steel takes 52.6. Now you're probably thinking, what about Hamada? Surely the biggest map at the launch of Battlefield 5 is somewhat comparable. Well, even Hamada on average, takes less time to rotate between flags than every single map in Battlefield 2042, excluding exposure because I did not test exposure for this video. The average time it takes to rotate to flags on Hamada is 59.8 seconds, a full 7 seconds faster than Manifest, the fastest Battlefield 2042 time. You spend more time riding the zip line from the F1 flag to the E1 flag on breakaway at 49 seconds than you do on 6 of Battlefield 5's launch maps. Now, is that ludicrous amounts of scale, or is that ludicrous amounts of scale? When I was done playing Hamada, I decided to celebrate by jumping around for a little bit, and then decided to go play a real round of Battlefield 5 after running around aimlessly for 3 hours, and I soon joined a lobby, saw a low level cheater with an AKD using the Commando Carbine, got shotgunned from a guy sitting in the corner, then I uninstalled. I was going to do the test on Battlefield 1 as well, but not only had I felt my point had been proven with the test that I did on Battlefield 5, I was also not going to pay for a server so I could run around it aimlessly for two more hours. I may be stupid, but I'm not dumb. In all seriousness, here is the important thing to remember when it comes to map design. Even a great map can have a bad flag or two. In this case, whether the map remains great depends entirely on 1. How the rest of the flags are positioned and influence map play, and 2. Whether those quote-unquote bad flags serve a purpose. A good example of this philosophy is Sinai Desert in Battlefield 1. The A and F flags are by definition flags that one would not consider to be among the main group of flags, yet they serve the role of giving 
giving each team a flag that they will occupy a majority of the time is easy to spawn on and rarely is an objective that will be attacked unless there are no other better options. There are way too many flags in Battlefield 2042 that serve no purpose whatsoever other than to simply exist to try and eliminate wasted space, which somehow there still manages to be an excess of. Orbital is one of the few exceptions to this problem with flag location. On a map where there is expected to be 128 players, it is assumed that the majority of players will be focused on the close cluster of flags, B, C1, C2, D1, D2. This creates a necessity to 1. have a safe gimme flag where each team will likely possess it, and 2. use this safe gimme flag to use as a staging spawn if the B, C, D flags are completely lost and no spawn is possible. It also should provide a buffer zone away from the main base, which reduces the possibility of base camping and most importantly it utilizes these flags as pull flags where a limited number of players will pull away from the main flags and rotate to attack them for the sake of the game objective this has the secondary effect of pulling a number of players away from the major battle going on around the b1 c and d flags hence the name of the pull flag. This prevents those zones from turning into a 128 player spawn camping farming explosive clusterfuck, at least in most circumstances, and the downside of these flag positions as expected is that players don't understand their true purpose and instead complain that they are always empty or there are no enemies here, they are a mile away from the action. While it is possible that the flags could be moved a hair closer towards the center of the map, their purpose and criticisms would likely remain the same. They are not meant to be hotbeds of action, they are meant to be game savers. While this works in favor of Orbital, the other maps in the game are not so well designed. The map must have playable zones, which actually focus the majority of a team in a meaningful way. In this, the majority of the 2042 maps fail miserably. Hourglass is by far the worst offender, with it having its focus clusters on the edges of the maps in which one side gets first dibs every time while the other team is required to worm surf across the sand on spice to get there. DICE's counter argument to everything of course that I just said is that they designed the maps to be this way on account of having 128 players on the map and while that argument may work for a map or two it doesn't work for a majority of them. If they wanted this they could have experimented with large maps which featured 10 to 15 flags at much closer intervals and Two, if they were going to spread them so far, then why the hell isn't there a ton of neutral transport vehicles at each point? All we are given are a few civilian trucks and sedans across the map that appear to be randomly in locations in which the player needs to find them. It does not help that the quote-unquote transport vehicles also have the bad habit in Battlefield 2042 of being entirely used offensively, with vehicles like the LATV Recon being equipped with a 30mm cannon and being used as a Walmart version BTR. Having a big map is not necessarily a negative thing, but spacing and player directional flow is incredibly important, and if several flags are a far distance apart, players need to have ample ability to reach them. This is where neutral transports come into play so heavily, something that 2042 lacks altogether. 2042 maps for the most part deserve significant criticism because they lack areas players want to go to for high density combat, and beyond that, lack nearby flags which allows players to quickly get back into the action. Far too often, the flags on a map are alone in an empty location and of a significant walking distance from one another. Making matters worse is the huge lack of cover or bland terrain between these zones, so instead of itching to get back into the fight, you sit at the respawn menu contemplating on whether or not you even want to spawn in. Circling back to the amount of time it takes to get from an objective to another objective, it's not just the average time it takes to get somewhere, it's the probability of surviving that journey as well. It leaves the player with the feeling of hopelessness of wanting to get somewhere but not being able to because they are exposed out in the open with no other options than to just pray that they make it. DICE can claim that this was all done for 120 players as much as they want, but in my opinion there is very little excuse for such poor design in the scale of these maps.
finally to wrap up the video today, what is the number one thing people talk about when they talk about how good Battlefield 1 was? The atmosphere. Battlefield 1 was so immersive, Battlefield 1 made you feel like you were really there. How about this term? Engaging. Battlefield 1 was engaging to play, and a lot of that had to do with the feeling of the maps and the way they were designed. Over the years, I have grown to have a deep appreciation as to how good the maps in Battlefield 1 actually were. To sit here and compare the pinnacle of map dressing in Battlefield games to the dung heap that is Battlefield 2042 might be a little unfair because at some point, you gotta recognize that Battlefield 1 had a one in a million art design and art direction, but I think it's really impossible to say what Battlefield 2042 does not do well without addressing how they were able to get it so right five years earlier. To say that only Battlefield 1 got it right is definitely a little facetious because there have been times that past games have been able to make maps really engaging to play. For example, there are the Battlefield 3 aftermath maps, Vietnam's jungles and tunnels. Battlefield 4 Operation Outbreak, Battlefield 3 Domovan Peak is another iconic example, uh, 1942 Stalingrad, 2142 s Ice, Snow, and Overall Futuristic Look, just to name a few examples. You see, you don't need a phenomenal engine to do all of this, just the right detail in art direction. I'd wager that as it pertains to Battlefield 1, the majority of the target audience didn't know an overwhelming amount about World War 1 apart from some of the basics. Trench warfare, mustard gas, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, maybe some famous battles such as Verdun and the Somme. Even though a lot of the mechanics and gameplay are romanticized and exaggerated for the enhancement of the game's gameplay loop, the game still left you feeling like like you were in World War I, and sure, maybe not everything was completely historically accurate, even if you knew absolutely nothing about the Great War, chances are you could hop into a game of Battlefield 1 and say, yep, this definitely feels like World War I. If you had to describe 2042, and you had to describe that to a friend, how would you describe the game? What does it feel like? I asked myself that same question and I had trouble finding a good answer. You could just say, oh, it's a Battlefield game set in the future timeline of Battlefield 4. But that in itself is incredibly vague and doesn't really give an accurate representation of what the game is supposed to be. Whereas Battlefield 1 builds on the history of World War 1 and feeds off our imagination to make something engaging, Battlefield 2042 has every opportunity to be daring and imaginative, but in every single way ends up being stale and boring. Being set in the near future, the ball was completely in DICE's court to do whatever they wanted to in terms of art design and creative direction, being that it's 2042, it hasn't happened yet. We don't know what the future holds for us as a species, so why in the hell has the game turned out to be so goddamn boring and bland at every corner? Battlefield 2042 is a game that sets the rules of its lore yet completely fails to live up to or abide by those rules. And I'm not trying to make this a conversation about lore in a maps video, but to the point, in a setting in which the world is in an economic and environmental crisis, why does everything feel so normal and boring? The maps in Battlefield 2042 are like that one Spongebob episode where Spongebob tries to be normal and completely changes his personality, but instead Instead of being normal, he ends up being utterly boring and wants to go back to being his quirky, fun self again. Despite being set in the future, the game lacks nearly any future feel, and despite being advertised as doom and gloom with environmental effects taking over, the maps don't reflect this whatsoever unless there is a tornado hovering above you and making your PC crash. Apart from Hourglass being completely submerged in sand, there are no instances in which the maps validate the world that we are supposed to be occupying. Windows on buildings are in perfect condition. The grass on Kaleidoscope is well maintained. There is no rubble anywhere on any streets, and the streets are clean and debris free. There is hardly any flooding or any sea level crisis nods. Even exposure is relatively irrelevant to the game's weather destruction plot, and there was a freaking landslide in that map. Either DICE purposely chose the most boring, safe, unimaginative options and locations for Battlefield 2042, or the design and direction of the maps are simply not designed well enough to be engaging. 
Even though the flow, readability, and overall design of the map is important, the art direction, atmosphere, and tuning to the setting matter just as much in terms of making a memorable map that people want to play over and over again. Set dressing is a part of the package, and unfortunately this part of the package was kicked and thrown around by your UPS driver. Not only are Battlefield 2042's maps irritating to play, but they are genuinely not memorable whatsoever. And that is the end of the video, ladies and gentlemen. You can probably tell that my voice is going a little bit. We recorded this all in one go. Please, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like on it and share it around the community. I know it was a super long one, but I appreciate appreciate you sticking to the end. You can see the voice is really going now. I spent a long time on this video, and I hope that it showed in the final product. Once again, I'd like to thank Gravity for his help with this video. Without him, this process would have been infinitely more stressful and difficult. Please go visit his channel and check out his videos if you are a Battlefield fan. If you enjoyed this video just that much, consider subscribing as I may make guides on how to improve at the game, some commentaries, and other videos from time to time. This will be the last video for a while, which is why I kind of went all in on it. Uh, I am moving next week, so I will be gone for a little while. So until I see you next time, thank you all so much for watching. My name is Catalyst, and I will see you all another time.